really delighted to present Representative Steve Ellison from Utah. He's going to talk about the Safe UT resource, which is just amazing, and can't wait to hear that from Representative Steve Ellison. And if we can also look forward to uh, what actually looking backward to other Crisis Jam presentations, if we can. Last week, we had an opportunity to see something from Richard McKeon talking about the National Strategy for Suicide Prevention. But if you've missed anything, you can go straight to that Crisis Talk Learning Community site, and you can pick up anything that you haven't seen before, anything you want to see again, and anything you want to share. You know, we've had some past really all-star presentations on the Crisis Jam. Here's our top five. You can see them on the YouTube station. You'll see the top two are from SAMHSA-hosted uh, individuals, Dr. Anita Everett, Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman. 988 went live in, in, in uh, July of last year, and we are looking forward to what I think is probably going to be another top five uh, and, and counting. Uh, this is the episode 135 on July 12, 2023. Monica Johnson, the newly appointed director of the 988 office, is going to help us celebrate 988 turning one. So we're going to see who's going to pop out of the cake on that day. We're going to be very excited for that. But I think that's going to be not only a well-attended, but uh, probably break all records in terms of number of views. There's a few articles we want to make sure that you're attending to. You can check them out in the chat, some links. This one, I think, is a, a terrific one talking about an outstanding program in Philadelphia, a crisis services program, which is essentially uh, very much a... a uh, an alternative to nine eight to nine one one, and that is uh, uh, the not only the sending out of mobile crisis teams, but also crisis intervention response teams in, in Philadelphia. Uh, HHS just recently announced these awards for uh, addressing the youth mental health health crisis here in the United States. Also, wanted to call your attention to this announcement. I believe this one, this next one, is from Vibrant Emotional Health. And this is the Asian American and Pacific Islander Mental Health Advisory Committee. Basically, it's the, also the Asian American and, and uh, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Mental Health Advisory Committee is being set up to help uh, us all better and more effectively reach and serve uh, the, the population that is least likely to seek help here in the United States. And that's Asian American and Pacific Islanders. I want to also note this particular resource. Uh, this was an article that is talking about a, a recent book that was written by Charlotte Maya following the death, the suicide death of her husband and the ritual of creating Sushi Tuesdays to help her and her family uh, cope. And it led to blogs and learning and teaching more about how we can all cope through suicide loss. Uh, be sure to read this article and check out her book. Now, we can't vote enough for this, for the People's Choice Award, Public Partnership, uh, Public Service Partnership Award. These honorees, Dr. John Palmieri, Richard McKeon, James Wright, our dear friends, please vote. Uh, if you got more than one email address, please do that. If you got more, uh, if you can have you know, friends and family vote, but you can do it every day. So let's not leave any votes unturned or any, any chads hanging. And for our merch table, the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline SAMHSA store has got a number of things that you may want to share with your friends, family, um, and yourself. Anywhere from safety plan pads, pads to stickers. Uh, we've got a, a number of Spanish options. So check it out if you haven't seen the Suicide uh, and Crisis Lifeline SAMHSA store. You can also get hats and t-shirts from the Crisis Jam sessions. Uh, there's a lot of people that will work that'll, that'll pay for these, but there's some people who are going to do it the hard way and actually sit in the trivia hot seat. Um, and I think we're warming up that hot seat right now. You get a free T-shirt if you do that. So any any if you're feeling like you can do this, well, here's one one example. I'm, I'm warming up the hot seat right now. And this may not look like something that we would be asking on crisis on, a, on, on the crisis jam, but you'll see it's something that is relevant. 
In 2010, 33 Chilean miners were trapped by a collapse 2,300 feet underground. Now we bur bury people six feet underground. This is 2,224 feet beneath that. Oh my gosh. So let's warm up that trivia hot seat and see who's going to be sitting in it today. Let's welcome Anna Schneeman. Anna, are you with us today? I am. Thanks, John. It's great to see you, Anna. Can you tell people who you are and where you're from? Yeah. Um, so my name is Anna Schneeman. I'm the Zero Suicide Coordinator for West Texas Counseling and Guidance out in San Angelo, Texas, and I'm also an LPC associate. Well, it's so glad, to, so good to have you here, Anna. I imagine, I know there's there's plenty of uh, oil mines going on in, in West Texas, but you don't see too many copper gold mines and certainly hopefully nothing like we saw in Chile in 2010. Do you remember this event in 2010? I actually don't. <laughs> so this is probably quite a surprise for you to get this, this question. It has some relevance, some analogy anyway, to the crisis now model of contact, outreach, and rescue. But let's give it a shot if we can. So this is the question. Which of the following key events in the rescue has an inaccurate timeline? Which one of these things do you think is least likely to be true? Uh, there's A, first contact three days, B, food, water, oxygen, 18 days, C, rescue workers to minors in 67 days, or rescue to safety in 69 days. Now, you can certainly phone a friend. You can go to the audience poll. We're polling the audience right now. I urge you all to vote. Anna, sounds like you're going to need a little help here. So where do you want to turn? What are you thinking about? Oh, I definitely will use the poll. Okay, good. Good. Let's let's give that a shot. We're getting some results and we'll have them for you shortly. And let's see what the audience thinks. All right. Some are saying it's pretty close between the first contact in three days and food, water, oxygen in 18 days. So there doesn't seem to be a, a huge, any kind of unanimous push in one way or another. What are you feeling? What what feels right to you? Um just in terms of survival, I'm going to choose B because I feel like 18 days would be a really, really, really long time to go without food, water, or oxygen. Mm, yeah. All right. Let's see what the actual answer is. Oh. No. Wow. 17 days before anybody got any contact? Wow. Well, Anna... You may not have gotten it right, but you're certainly going to feel right in that new 988 t-shirt. Woohoo! Thanks, for so glad to have you. Thank you for joining us today. And speaking of thank yous, talk about this thank you from Jorge Gallegos, who was pulled out of the, he was the 11th miner who was brought to safety. Thank you for believing that we were alive. Again, not contacting them for 17 days. So let's let's see if we can turn to our presenter today. I'm so delighted to present to you Steve Ellison, Ellison, who's the representative in Utah and has been there for quite doing some amazing work in Utah for years. In fact, my first conversation with Steve was I think 2015 or 2016 when he phoned me up uh, talking to me about this crazy idea of a three-digit number that was being proposed in Utah for suicide and crisis services, and they realized they couldn't do it just in Utah. So he said, uh, I, I hear you can only do this nationally. What do you think of this idea, Dr. Draper? Uh, and ever since then, Steve and I have been in touch, and he's been a great inspiration for us. This was uh, this is a, a new example, perhaps, of something that was an idea that was born in Utah that could become a national tre treasure, hopefully just like 988. Steve, do you want to tell us a little bit about Safe UT? Absolutely. Uh, thanks, John. So uh, Safe UT, to put this in context, you have to look at our uh, three pillars of uh, crisis intervention, someone to call, uh, someone to respond, and a safe place to go. Uh, Safe UT fits into that first pillar, someone to call. In this case, it's mostly someone to text. Now, it's it's an app, Safe UT app, and uh, it's so much more than an app, though. It's a system of care. It's staffed 24-7, 365 days a year by licensed clinical social workers uh, with master's degrees. 
And it had its genesis back um, uh, after the Columbine shooting where uh, to, uh, Colorado launched a program called Safe to Tell. And we wanna do something like that in Utah to report school safety threats. However, we decided just kind of, was kind of on a whim to say, well, why don't we give the students uh, someone to, to talk to also uh, via phone or text um, if they wanna talk about mental health issues? Well, that's the, the part of the app that has just uh, absolutely grown like crazy. The school safety component is important also. So let me go over some, some background statistics, uh, if we can cue the slide there. So since 1970, there have been over 2,000 school shootings, which is absolutely tragic. Uh, next, next point. Um, in 2020, there were 96 school shootings recorded, and in 2021, that number uh, more than doubled to over 202. Um, in Utah, suicide is the leading cause of death for children ages 10 to 17. I believe nationally it's number two. And in just the past 12 months in Utah, uh, Utah's lost approximately 40 children to suicide. Uh, in no way minimizing the Uvalde tragedy, but that's more than double the number of children that died in that tragedy. But yet we don't really talk about the, the, the number of children dying from suicide and the school shootings get the national headlines. Fortunately, and in uh, definitely large part to save UT, Utah has never had a school shooting that resulted in a death on campus other than a suicide. Um, okay, next slide. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the school safety component of Safe UT, and then we'll move into the crisis intervention. So the Secret Service issued this report recently, and the number one finding that they recommended in terms of preventing targeted school violence is when communities identify warning signs and intervene. Uh, next slide. Um, and this is fascinating data of, of potential school shooters, 94% uh, communicated their intentions with others. And 69% uh, um, of, of those uh, communications were observed by peers. Next slide. Okay, so let, let's talk about the, the impact of, of Safe UT. Um, next slide. Okay, so it was developed in response to Utah's unacceptably high youth suicide rates. As I mentioned, suicide is the leading cause of death for young people in Utah. Um, in fact, we, we lose about 3,000 years of potential human life every year based on the number of children we lose to suicide. Um, because we want parents and children, the students that are using this to trust it, uh, they are connected to a licensed uh, master's level counselor at the Huntsman Mental Health Institute that's part of the University of Utah Academic Medical Center. The counselors are uh, ready to confidentially listen to any size crisis or concern, no cost 24 seven, 365 days a year. And so basically this is a therapist in their pocket available anytime, anywhere, and at no cost and can be completely anonymous and confidential. Next slide. Um, this is a, just a very short video that's going to give us an overview of what Safe UT is. When we ask for help, it can have a lot of meanings. Especially when it comes to our emotions. Safe UT is a no-cost, confidential app that connects you with a licensed counselor who's there to help you through any sized struggle you may be going through. Sometimes it's a temporary obstacle and you just need someone to talk you to the other side. Other times, it's not so temporary. A counselor is someone who can be there for you. Listening and providing cover. And sometimes life can get so overwhelming. You feel like you're fighting to survive. That's when a counselor can be a lifeline. You can call, you can text. It can be for you, or you can use the anonymous tip line for someone you're worried might hurt themselves or others. Safe UT is here for you, whether it's something big, something small, or something where you're not even sure what it is. Don't ignore it. Try talking to someone. It's always better to be safe.
All right, thank you. So just to give you a quick little history of Safe UT back in 2014, <clears throat> we set up a, a commission to, to study school safety. And then the, the following year, uh, Senator Dan Thatcher, who's uh, been on the crisis jam before, and myself uh, sponsored uh, the bill that created the program. Uh, initially, uh, it had very little funding and we just started out with a handful of schools. It was voluntary. Schools didn't have to adopt this but we've had every high school, middle school, and almost every elementary school, as well as a number of private schools, uh, voluntarily sign up for this program uh, since 2015. Um, we then in 2018 added our system of higher education, colleges, universities, technical schools. And then in 2019, uh, the Utah National Guard said, you know, we think this could be really beneficial for uh, the members of the Guard as well as their families. And so we stood up a, a separate app called Safe UT NG for the National Guard. And just like Safe UT, this is both for uh, kind of our, our, our primary uh, audience, uh, in this case would be Guard members, but it can also be for their family members. So if a, a spouse of a, a Guard member is concerned uh, about their loved one, they can uh, chat again at no cost confidentially with a a counselor anytime, day or night, to determine how they can help. Same functionality exists for parents within Safe UT, as well as teachers and administrators. And then in 2020, uh, without knowing that there was going to be a, a pandemic, we uh, launched uh, Safe UT Frontline, and that is a separate app based on the same technology that is uh, for healthcare workers. Uh, li uh, firefighters, law enforcement, and all first responders. We know that uh, a firefighter is more likely to die by suicide than a fire. Uh, a law enforcement officer is more likely to die from their own service weapon than that of an assailant. And that for healthcare workers, we know that for physicians, that suicide is uh, a higher risk in terms of causes of mortality than for their patients. So all vulnerable groups and um, all are benefiting from these unique programs. Okay, next slide. Um, so we believe that Utah is the, the model for uh, school safety and also mental health uh, tip lines with a behavioral health first approach. What really distinguishes Utah from other states, because many other states have tip lines, is that those tips are routed to law enforcement. And just like our whole paradigm shift in crisis intervention, Law enforcement would rather have uh, qualified behavioral health individuals responding first instead of law enforcement. I've heard numerous individuals across the nation talk about their frustration um, with these tip lines because students are often uh, talking about mental health issues that they're having or a friend's having, and they don't feel qualified to respond. So we have counselors on the front end, if they need to involve law enforcement, which we'll talk about in just a minute, uh, they have all the avenues to, to do that very timely and in a, a, a collaborated, uh, coordinated manner. Um, they can submit confidential tips to counselors who triage the safety risk. So um, the, in, in the terms of use, it says if this is um, a matter of life or safety, we can actually locate you uh, via your URL, and we call those active rescues that happens on a regular basis. Um, I have heard numerous stories where this has been implemented and it saved a lot of lives, including a story of a, a, young, a young woman standing on the edge of a, a railroad track, another young man who was standing on the edge of a cliff who had promised uh, his pastor he would use this app before he took his life. In that case, they literally uh, talked the young man off the ledge. Um, as I mentioned, they coordinate with uh, school administrators and law enforcement to act on credible threats. Next slide. Um, this is for the past fiscal year. This will be updated soon when June's finished. So this data is almost a year old, but we had 28,000 unique chats. That those are almost all through the, the, the texting feature built into the app, which is secured by a password. I mentioned those active rescues. We had 349 life-saving interventions. So that's almost one a day. Um, and in terms of the, the tips that have come in, we've had over 8,500 tips. If you break those down, uh, the number one category is suicide. 
Uh, number two is bullying, uh, school threats and violence, some sort of crisis, and then mental health concerns in general. And there's a lot of different categories, these tips that can come in. Um, I'm reminded of one that a principal told me where he got a, uh, a call from the Safe UT uh, a crisis uh, worker on a Friday night saying a young woman just said that her best friend's going to attempt suicide tonight. She can't get a hold of her and she doesn't know what to do. Uh, the crisis workers have every principal's cell phone number in the state. They call that principal at home. He looked up the girl's parents' information and contacted the parents. They uh, located her with her, uh, you know, find my iPhone or whatever, and were able to rescue her shortly before she made an attempt on her life. So just, a, just another example of how other people use this on behalf of other people who are in crisis. Okay, next slide. Um, in terms of the original genesis of Safe UT, which was focused on school safety, um, the, we've, it's, it's a minority of the tips that come in, but they're still critically important. Uh, the, the, uh, of the 801 tips that were submitted in the past uh, fiscal year, the number one uh, tip was related to firearms, some sort of planned school attack. Uh, you can see the different categories there. I had one principal tell me that uh, they got a tip from the Safe UT uh, uh, department saying that a young man was planning to bring a gun to school. And he waited at the, the school doors. And when he saw the young man, he said, come into my office. I need to, to talk with you, asked uh, to look in his backpack. The tip was only half right. Uh, there wasn't just one loaded handgun, there were two. And so we have stories like this all the time where incidents of school violence have been averted. Um, all right, uh, next slide. This is a, just a quick story that the family has agreed to share, uh, a, a real experience from a user. A text came in, um, she says, the young woman says, I'm, I'm suicidal and feel like things aren't getting any better. My parents are fighting. My dad is trying to take me from my mom and it's making me want to kill myself because I don't want to choose. Next slide. Um, after a supportive conversation, the Safe UT counselor recognized the texture was in danger and connected with their mother. Uh, she had no uh, idea about her child's emotional struggles. Next slide. Uh, the mother who worked night shifts uh, when her child used Safe UT switched to, to a daytime job so she could spend more time with her child. Next slide. Um, six months later, uh, the mother reports that her child is doing much better to therapy and is eager to uh, switch your health insurance so they can continue uh, th those therapeutic uh, uh, interventions. All right, next slide. All right, so that uh, that pretty much sums up Safe UT. Now, uh, we've, we have had a number of inquiries from other states and entities uh, about the ability to do this in, in their state. One thing I just can't emphasize strongly enough is that, yes, it's some about the technology. Um, if you look at the app, it's really simplistic in terms of so they can call someone, they can text the counselor, um, or they can look at previous chats and tips. It's very simple. The back end is very uh, complicated where that crisis worker can see the entire history of the chats with that, uh, that individual. And so they can give them guidance based on um, you know, what uh, uh, advice has been given before and follow up on the, the prior conversation. Um, but when we've had other entities look at this, they're like, well, it's as simple as just, uh, you know, maybe licensing the app from the state of Utah. The, the big secret here is the benefit is in the very well-trained counselors, one of which we'll hear from in just a minute, um, that staff the back end 24-7, 365. Our Safe UT crisis department is embedded in our statewide crisis center. This is where all of our 988 calls, our warm line calls, and our MCOT teams are dispatched from. So the Safe UT counselors can also dispatch an MCOT team if that's needed. And so the, the back end with real people is one of the keys to success. So uh, that finishes my presentation. I had 15 minutes and we're right on the dot. Steve, thank you so much again for all the amazing work that you and your colleagues are doing. And you're really leading a lot of this incredible work in Utah. I can't, I can't, tell you how much I and many of us appreciate your dedication to suicide prevention in Utah. And again, this is something we see that could very much, much become a national resource. It's also a reminder too that of, of data that I've seen that I, you've probably heard about that about 80% of school shooters and mass shooters 
uh, are thinking about suicide first, that essentially they are suicidal before they become homicidal in many ways, then suicide prevention becomes homicide prevention. Uh, so again, this, this, this resource, I think, is really key in being able to address both issues in many ways. Uh, well, there's a few questions in the chat I wanted to turn to. You were talking about the back end and crisis counselors. Uh, there was a question about who is responding. Can you say a little bit more about who's responding, what, who these crisis counselors are? Uh, yes. So they are <clears throat> licensed clinical social workers uh, with master's degrees and with special training on how to, to deal with youth. They have special training on how to interface with uh, the, the, the school personnel. There's a point person at every school that's in charge of safe UT tips that are not um, time sensitive. So if a tip comes in that uh, I'm being bullied or some other, you know, somebody spray painted the, the, the hallway, uh, th those tips are taken care of at the local level. But the crisis counselors screen every tip that comes in real time. And if it's acute and time sensitive, they take it from there. Otherwise, the school can take care of it. So, it, so far, it, it's only just uh, master's level clinicians. Go through the crisis center first. Is that the crisis counselors are at like uni, the, the crisis center in Utah? Is that the way that works? Y yes, they're at the Huntsman Mental Health Institute's crisis center. Right. Fantastic. There's a couple of other questions here. Um, how do you receive feedback and evaluations from those who are using the app? Um, they will occasionally follow up with students to ask them how they're doing and get the feedback, you know, just directly from the users. They've also had numerous stories where uh, parents have called and thanked them and shared the story of how they didn't know their child was struggling. And the, 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 the crisis workers encourage the students to work with their parents or another caring adult if for some reason uh, they don't feel comfortable working with their parents to get help. And so many uh, success stories have come kind of around the back end when uh, they have a positive story to share how Safe UT opened the door to get their child the help that they desperately needed. And then one more question before we turn to our round table. Uh, I was asked about how many folks are, are covered currently? How many kids is this reaching the population covered by the app currently? And about how much does it cost? Yeah, so all, all students in Utah, in our public schools, some of our private schools, as well as all of our higher ed institutions, uh, 16 institutions uh, can download the app and use it for free. Um, it's, it's at no cost to our schools. Uh, the state sponsors the program and it, the overall total cost of the state ends up being maybe between two to three dollars per student per year. That's the all in cost, uh, which includes, you know, the 24 7 365 coverage. Thanks so much, Steve, and thanks for the questions to our folks in the chat room. Kathy Davis, Denna Allerton from uh, the Suicide Prevention Specialist, Utah State Board of Education and Safe UT's manager are on our round table. Let's welcome them. I see Kathy, and, is, and there's, there's Demma. Good to see you, Demma. All right. Kathy, you want to uh, say a few words about what you do and some of your reflections and on, on what uh, your experience has been with Safe UT. Oh, absolutely. And then I'll just backtrack to let you know that there's approximately 675,000 students that will benefit from Safe UT. About 88% are in our, our public school, are in our 41 school districts, and then the other 12% are in charter schools. So my um, position is really unique. I I don't know that there are any other state suicide prevention specialists housed at a state department of education. And when I first met uh, Representative Elison, he said, you're a little bit like the little Dutch girl, aren't you? And I said, I don't want to be the little Dutch girl. And so in, in, in other words, my mantra is never worry alone. And so I've really been able to collaborate with so many different people. And I just want to applaud Representative Ellison. He is one of my heroes, my mentor, and has done so much to really move the needle because I think we know, especially after COVID, that if you do not address the mental health concerns of your students, the academic outcomes are not going to be realized. We, we know that we have to address the mental health needs of our students. 
And so I collaborate with Demma, I collaborate with so many other people. Thank you so much, Kathy. Really you appreciate bet. your reflections on that. And Demma, can you join us? Yes. Um, are you guys able to hear me okay? Yes, you're loud and clear. Thanks for joining Great. us. So I just dropped in the chat our uh, link to our annual report that has some really wonderful information about um, our impact and uh, our population and some of the research initiatives we have. So as was mentioned earlier, I'm the Safe UT program manager. Um, all of our clinicians are staffed out of the Huntsman Mental Health Institute here in Utah. And um, as was mentioned before, they are all master's level clinicians or higher. Uh, many of them have uh, their own careers in various populations. And then when they come to us, we um, really train them in crisis intervention and suicide prevention. Um, something I wanted to mention about the follow-up uh, process that was asked in an earlier question is that we actually have a team of researchers out of the Department of Psychiatry at Huntsman Mental Health, and um, they really look at some outcomes for Safe UT. Uh, what they're starting with really is how, how useful and how helpful and how supported do students feel when they use the app, and um, we're, we're seeing some, some really high success rates from that uh, with goals to have uh, even more involvement from our research team on issues with safe UT. So I'd encourage you to check out our annual report uh, for some of those exciting uh, pieces of information that we're working on. Thank you so much, Demma. Really appreciate all the work that you're doing behind the scenes to make Safe UT uh, a resource that is actually keeping people safe in Utah. And it sounds like a significant number of people are not only finding it useful, but it's actually making a difference um, with the number of, of, of active rescues um, or emergency services or interventions that have been occurring. It does sound like it's making a difference. Um, but what I also heard you say is that um, is that students are feeling like it's helping them feel more secure. That's a that's a significant statement. Uh, that just carrying this around itself um, helps helps kids feel more safe at school, especially when you're at schools now, where one of the things they're trying to help kids feel safe at school is by doing active shooter dr drills. This is even better. Yeah. Do you have any reflections on some of the things, some of the, the, the things you've heard specifically some of the students say about why it helps them feel more safe? Yeah, absolutely. It's it is um a pretty important statistic. I think a lot of times when we run programs, we think, well, of course it helps. We know it helps, but to be able to do that follow-up research and actually hear from the users how helpful. Um, some of the things that are mentioned, and you can see this in our annual report, is that um, the counselors show respect towards the students. So we really emphasize confidentiality, which is tricky, I think, with the teen population because um, there's there's so much concern about from the teens. I don't want my parents to know, but from us as adults, hey, we really want to know when you're struggling. And so it is that fine balance of respecting the the individual where they're at and taking them along the journey if they need to work with an adult to say, hey, this is actually going to be good for you. This isn't going to be harmful. Um, and, you know, in just one of the numbers to remember is that we had uh, over 300 active rescues last year, uh, which means over uh, 300 times we sent out um, first responders for a welfare check to individuals, excuse me, almost 350 last year. Um, yeah. And this means that there were times that we had to break confidentiality and we did get these people help and saved these lives. What's really fascinating is when we follow up with these situations, parents say, I had no idea they had this app. I had no idea mm -hmm. they were talking to someone in the middle of the night, uh, but I'm really glad that they were, and I'm really glad you were there. So part of our mantra is, you know, we're here while you're sleeping or you're busy or, you know, not available to be there for your teen, but we're always going to connect them back with you. 
Really appreciate again all the work you do. This is a terrific resource. Thank for, thank you all for sharing it with us today. Uh, we're going to turn now to our SAMHSA updates. John Palmieri is with us. John, thanks, John. Uh, good to be here. It seems like it's been a while, so it's good to see everybody. Uh, a couple of things that I just wanted to highlight uh, for this week. One is the uh, notices of funding opportunity that I think the team has probably already flagged. Uh, in the previous couple of weeks, but just wanted to let everyone know that those uh, opportunities are still open. Uh, both the Crisis Center follow-up grant program and the State and Territory 90-Day Grant Program, those deadlines are coming up at the end of June. I believe it's the 26th. Um, and then the Tribal 90-Day Response um, Notice of Funding Opportunity, the deadline for that is uh, mid-July. Uh, so still, um, opportunities to apply. And then if there are questions about the application process, uh, certainly reach out to our team uh, who would be happy to answer. I know that there have been a couple of webinars uh, to support uh, information sharing about the application, but if there are additional questions, we're happy, happy to answer those. I also wanted to highlight that SAMHSA did uh, put out the uh, national model standards for peer support certification. Uh, you may recall that there had been uh, a request for public comment on this, and these were uh, ultimately released, uh, which is very consistent with the strategy to accelerate adoption, recognition, integration of peer workforce across all elements of the healthcare system. Uh, these standards are inclusive of mental health, substance use, and family youth peer certification. So. Uh, really happy that this uh, work has been able to be released. It's obviously not the end of the conversation. There's more to come, uh, but this is an important step uh, in, in providing that recognition, acknowledgement, uh, and emphasis on uh, the importance of uh, peer support workforce uh, across the behavioral health space and certainly in the crisis space as well. Um, and then finally, just wanted to um, add that behind the scenes, you know, obviously there's a lot of preparation for the one year anniversary uh, of 988. So there'll be more to come on that, but certainly uh, some additional um, um, uh, highlights and um, modifications and new uh, products in the partner toolkit that will be coming out uh, as well as uh, a lot of travel for the team around various uh, locations across the country, both to highlight the importance of 98 implementation at the local level, which is something that we've continued to stress, uh, and also to uh, show how jurisdictions are connecting 988 to that broader crisis continuum in very innovative and effective ways. And so always looking forward to opportunities to be able to spotlight that innovation at the local level uh, where it's happening. Uh, and I think that's it for me for now, John. Thank you. Thanks, John. Really, really exciting to hear about the national standards for peer certification. You're right. That is the beginning of hopefully what will be a much longer conversation and evolution of involving peers in all the work that we're doing. Um, now, I, I guess you all are probably wondering what's cooking in the world of state mental health authorities. Well, we can answer that question for you with Deb Pinels. Deb, you want to give us an update through Nashville? Yeah, absolutely. Well, today's update is a little bit of a, a primer um, that we wanted to talk about because we've been doing a lot of discussion in amongst the state leaders uh, about uh, EMTALA. So we can go to the next slide. Our Children, Youth, and Families Division has their annual virtual meeting. And in our May presentation, we provided, Dr. Hepburn and I provided an overview of EMTALA. And I think it's important for this Crisis Jam community just to remind themselves about EMTALA, what it is, what it requires. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna give you some background on that. So we can go to the next slide. So EMTALA stands for the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act. Uh, it was passed in 1986 re related largely to Medicare to prevent what was called patient dumping, which involved transferring uninsured patients for financial reasons from private to public hospitals, regardless of how much medical need or whether they were stable or not. Uh, this has been considered to be a very significant law, and in many ways, it was designed uh, to prevent discrimination because often people that were uninsured were marginalized communities. Uh, and so uh, this um, 
law in some ways was born out of scientific data that was showing that these transfers of people who were unemployed, minoritized, were having increased death risk of death upon transfer. We've certainly seen a lot now about maternal mortality. So it's just as re uh, relevant today to think about this and making sure that people are stable before they get moved from one site to another. And again, very important as we think about crisis services and mental health stability. Next slide. So uh, EMTALA is um, uh, managed through CMS. Court decisions have happened uh, at, um, at a broad level. There's one Supreme Court case that's looked at, at EMTALA, but mostly what happens is that there is going to be the inspector general office that's going to look at complaints and make reviews and then uh, create um, fines, if you will, to uh, violators of EMTALA. Uh, the resulting landscape of EMTALA is that it not only applies to emergency departments, a lot of people think, well, if I work in an inpatient psychiatric unit, I'm exempt from EMTALA because it's not an emergency department uh, or in other parts of a hospital. But in fact, the way EMTALA lays out the duties, uh, in, it does impose these three legal duties that applies to hospitals broadly that are recipients of Medicare funding, which frankly includes most hospitals uh, and many other settings. And we have to think about that as we move forward in the settings that we're creating in our crisis continuum. Next slide. So the first two duties are that the hospital um, or the setting that uh, receives the CMS fundings that qualifies, and there's definitions of who qualifies, they must perform a medical screening for anyone who comes to the hospital and requests care, whether there's an emergency medical condition or not. So that screening is going to be very key. And when there is an emergency medical condition, the hospital staff must stabilize the condition to the extent of their ability and, or transfer to another hospital with the appropriate capabilities. And we can think about somebody who might need, you know, specialized trauma supports, like from a gunshot wound or something like that, who might need to be transferred where there's specialists or hand surgeons. But the key is, once there's an emergency medical condition, the patient has to be stabilized to the extent of the hospital's ability um, or, or transferred with the appropriate stabilization on the way to the transfer, uh, with the transfer. Next slide. An emergency medical condition is defined uh, as a condition manifesting itself by acute symptoms of sufficient severity, such, as, such that the absence of immediate medical attention could reasonably be expected to result in placing the individual's health or the health of an unborn child in serious jeopardy, serious impairment to bodily functions, or serious dysfunction of bodily organs. And this is where we, uh, when we work in our emergency departments, need to think about our psychiatric patients along these same definitions. Next slide. The third duty of EMTALA is that hospitals with specialized capabilities, such as hospitals with psychiatric units or other specialized units, are required to accept transfers of patients in need of specialized services if they have the capacity to treat them. Um, again, think specialized pediatric or trauma units, but in our case, specialized psychiatric units. And that's called the reverse dumping provision. Instead of uh, being discharged prematurely without being stabilized, people who aren't admitted. So we can think about this as, as one aspect of what we need to look at, along with many, many other things with regard to emergency department boarding. This idea behind duty three prevents specialized hospitals from accepting transfer only those patients with the ability to pay for their services. That was the original uh, framework. Um, but capacity to treat is not a fixed definition. Um, but however, if there's patterns and practices of leaving open beds, that could be an EMTALA violation. Um, if a patient is sent over and the receiving of the facility wasn't prepared for the patient, that could be um, a reportable issue. Uh, and of course, patients can refuse transfer, but this should be documented. So we need to think about that with our crisis services. Next slide. There are specific rights that patients should be re should realize and people should familiarize themselves with about EMTALA. Uh, again, the right to be screened, um, having treatment stabilized, um, try and no delay in examination and treatment. And there's lots of details behind this. This is just a broad overview. Next slide. So I really just wanted to cover that, have get people thinking, juices flowing. Um, we also have many more things on the horizon with NASHVID. We're working on our 10 papers for technical assistance. You will see those soon uh, as the summer uh, uh, 
as the summer emerges. And I'm very excited to partner with this Crisis Jam. Fantastic presentations today. And thank you very much. And thank you, Deborah. Really appreciate, again, the update from Nashville. This is such an important area in TALA that helps protect against discrimination on so many levels. Uh, and we have got with us now Stephanie Hepburn and my old friend, Dr. DeQuincy Mifren Lazine. Uh, Stephanie, you want to talk a little bit about the new crisis talk? Yeah, thanks, John. Well, um, I'd like to bring on uh, Dr. DeQuincy Mifren Lazine. Um, you shared with me that you wish what you could wish uh, what you wished rather to convey to your younger self, but also to young people today generally. And you said you wish they and your former self could be open to possibility. Can you tell us what that means? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, glad to join um, on the crisis talk. Um, I think that um, sometimes we have given this unrealistic uh, presentation that things are definitely going to get better or that things will improve the next day or, or soon. Um, and we all know that that's not really realistic and it doesn't come across necessarily as authentic. Um, but at the same time, we know that um, there's no guarantees that things are going to get better. There's also no guarantees that things are going to get worse or that they will stay the same. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just being open to the possibility of change, the op uh, being open to the possibility that things could get better. Um, and just knowing that um, just like there are unpleasant surprises or traumas that happen, there are also pleasant surprises that can happen. Um, and being aware of those or bringing those back into awareness for somebody um, can really have an impact because it takes it away from that kind of black and white thinking that there's only one possibility that's going to happen in the future. And when you talked about your own experience, um, you said that with retrospection, especially when not in a crisis, was helpful because you could look back and say, you know what, I at the moment, this is how I was feeling, but I look back and I see the good that was woven throughout that experience as well. Um, and you mentioned meeting your best friend, uh, I think the first day or second day at college. Um, and also, uh, you know, I think it was a college scholarship. And, but you also put the caveat that a retrospective analysis is helpful, um, but not necessarily in a crisis. Can you kind of, can you talk about that distinction? Sure, I think in a crisis, we're just um, really narrowed down on the pain that's happening. Um, and it gets super easy to remember all the negative things that have happened. Um, that's just kind of psychology. When you're in a, a painful spot, it's easy to remember painful memories. Um, and so it can be really hard to, to think about the times that have been um, good in life. It's easy to think about the times that have been traumatic or, or sudden loss. Um, but I think that when somebody is not in that traumatic space um, and a little bit more neutral ground, um, then being able to think back and specifically looking back for the times where there was a pleasant surprise or the times where things suddenly went right, um, where it seemed like um, there was not going to be anything that would um, happen that would be positive the next day, but then something happened. Um, it's kind of like you know, playing the lottery, people don't play because they're guaranteed to win. They play because there's a possibility of winning something really great. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't know when that's going to come. I think the last part I'd like to touch on, um, you know, when you were talking about using your safety plan, I thought it was so interesting that over time, it was something that you revisit and revise, revise what needs to be revised. Can you talk a little bit about how it's it's this organic process for you. Uh, yeah, I think that, you know, especially as quickly as things move now, um, something that's a good distraction or a social group that's helpful um, at one point in time, um, perhaps when somebody was first discharged from the hospital um, or when I was in college or something or in grad school, it's not going to be the same later. Um, mm -hmm. So going back and revisiting that to make sure that the things that are there are the things that are going to be are really impactful for the person as they currently are in their current life, I think makes a big difference because then it's actually a useful safety plan and then it actually has a better impact. Thank you so much for hopping on the call with me.
I'll pass it back to you, John. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank thanks, you. Stephanie. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, John. Yeah, thanks to Quincy, and really a big thank you for all your pioneering work in suicide prevention, specifically related to bringing in the voice of suicide attempt survivors. Many of you uh, may know that he was the uh, the primary author of the Way Forward, the seminal 2014 document on uh, from the, the Task Force of Suicide Attempt Survivors, and uh, he's currently uh, Quin De Quincey is currently the co-author of what will become the National Strategies of Suicide Prevention that will be published next year. Thank you again, and also uh, an advanced thank you to Terrence Smithers from RA International, who's going to talk to us about how we keep the promise of 988 and make sure that care feels like care. Terrence, thank you, Doctor. Uh, John, and uh, thank you, Karen. You know, when Karen asked me to speak, um, I was trying to think of a story, and I knew I had to have one because I'm really old. Um, so it's kind of in one story um, that uh, I, you know, had 988 been around, it would have been a different experience. But I <clears throat> I had been homeless for about a year, um, and, and I'm I'm in co-occurring recovery, but I had stopped using any substances. Um, I was just mentally unwell and wandering the streets of Phoenix, wondering what happened. I had been a therapist for many years. Life fell apart, you know, and um, I finally knew something had to change. And so I, I went to a, 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 a hospital uh, in downtown Phoenix and I went in and, and I said, you know, <clears throat> please don't do a workup. Give me a phone number and send me out the door. It was about 2 a.m. Um, and they were wonderful. They did a workup, gave me a phone number and sent me out the door. And, and I'm sitting on a busy intersection of Phoenix, sobbing, uh, not knowing what to do next. Um, but I, I, for my years as a therapist, I knew how to get an automatic 72. Um, and so I made a very, very, and, and this was really sad, I made a very calculated attempt on my life. Um, no wish to die uh, because uh, I had lost a brother to suicide uh, and I didn't want to do that to my family, but I was desperate. And so I went back to the same hospital and, you know, said, you know, how do you like me now? Um, they didn't have a mental health unit or, or mental health department. They put me on a gurney, they, they patched me up, put me on a gurney um, in a hallway by the ER. And I was in and out of awarenesses all night, but there was this charge nurse. Um, and, and I was really desperate at this point because I just felt like my life didn't matter to these people. Um, and, and so I was on this gurney and Staff would walk by and I was getting uh, what I perceived as really judgmental looks, um, you know, with suicide being a moral issue. Um, and, but there was this church and this big personality and she had that place running like clockwork. Um, and as far as I knew, she wasn't paying attention to me at all. Um, so they came in the morning to, to admit me, send me to another hospital. And as, as they were wheeling me away, she said, you know, I don't know who you were meant to be, but I hope you stick around long enough to find out. That so hits me, this is many years ago, um, but it was the first light of hope, not, not my hope, but the hope that she had for me, you know, and, and I think, you know, I had gotten to that such 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 a desperate place that I was willing to, you know, make an attempt on my life um, because there was no one to listen, no one to call, and no one to care. Um, and and at that point, really not a safe place to go. Um, so, you know, where we are now with with nine eight eight, um, people in positions like mine, you know, um, at the time won't have to go through what I went through. Um, you know, that, that call will be available. That text will be available. Um, and and I, I do get very emotional about it. Be, and, and I'm not complaining. It's where we were at the time. Um, and I'm just so grateful that we're somewhere else. You know, I've, I've worked in behavioral health most of my uh, adult life. Uh, 
behavioral health and education and the um, program director, manager of training development for RI. And, um, and to see, you know, where we have come to is um, just amazing. Uh, and and this nine eight this crisis jam has been a, a a wonderful inspiration to me week after week. Terrence, thank you so much for sharing your lived expertise with us and being vulnerable and telling us that powerful story today. Uh, we're going to turn now to the federal updates. Sarah Corcoran from Guide Consulting. Thank you, John. Um, so. We've been seeing a lot of news coverage of the debt ceiling negotiations for the past several months, and a bill was signed into law over the past weekend. So I've got a couple quick updates on the impact that the contents of this bill may potentially have on the next two fiscal year uh, federal uh, appropriations processes. Uh, so very quickly, um, uh, regular order, as it's marked here on this left-hand slide, means that each of the 12 appropriations subcommittee bills is passed uh, in by both chambers, House and Senate, and signed into law. Uh, so if we go through regular order, meaning all 12 bills are able to be signed uh, in advance of FY24 and FY25, uh, the FY24, which begins in October of this year, um, non-defense numbers should stay relatively even with our current FY23 spending. This does not guarantee that every line item will be exactly the same, but that overall it should be relatively level in that non-defense uh, world for the next uh, this this upcoming fiscal year. For the next fiscal year, FY24, there looks to be a one percent increase in overall domestic. Um, spending uh, based on the agreement that was signed into law over the weekend. If we do not go through the regular order by January of the calendar year 24 and 25 respectively, that would trigger a 1% across the board cut. Uh, sequestration is what it's also known as, uh, and this does not mean it's a 1% even, uh, but this also would be uh, applying to both defense and non-defense spending which is a bit of an incentive uh, for both sides to come to the table and try to find an agreement before um, that date triggers for FY24 in January of next year, and then for FY25 in January of the following year. On the right-hand side, we've got a list of rescissions for unobligated funds that were uh, appropriated through the American Rescue Plan. Uh, this basically means that they would claw back um, any sort of funding that is left over from these previously appropriated pots of money. Um, one thing to flag, we expect that most of this funding, if not all of it, has already gone out the door. Uh, we don't have the exact numbers, but when you see appropriated at 80 million in this first uh, this first line, it does not mean that 80 million is coming back to the federal government. So it's not uh, as big of a cause for concern, but just showing you what the, the original numbers were that were appropriated. Um, and then the last thing I'll flag at the bottom is the Medicaid mobile crisis state planning grants that was appropriated at $15 million. Those have all gone out the door. So that not, none of that money should be coming back and unobligated really just means that it was leftover funding at the agency level that has not been given out to states or grantees, um, which since this is about two years old at this point, most if not all of this funding has already gone out the door. So again, it's not as big of a uh, dire concern uh, that, uh, mo that a majority of this money would be going back to the federal government. And I'm happy to answer questions in the chat. Thank you, Sarah. Appreciate it. We're a little short on time. Unfortunately, we're going to have to skip the state updates this time around. So we're going to skip ahead just to remind you all about Moving America's Soul on Suicide. We did begin our today's session with Moving America's Soul with the uh, the Logic song, and there's always these other forms of media that are beautiful, beautiful stories told. If you haven't seen them, please see them, share them, and tell people about them. For next week, we're going to look forward to a, a, a fantastic uh, a presentation from the Suicide Prevention Resources Lived Experience Director, Susie Reese, who's going to talk about their initiatives. Uh, looking forward to that. And then the week after that, there's going to be a presentation by Haley Van Irem, the ADA Act and Mental Health. Really appreciate you all taking some time out of your busy day to join the Crisis Jam with us and me today. 
Uh, looking forward to spreading a little jam on your toast next week. Take care now. Bye-bye.